Lovely. Um, so I, my name is Natasha. I'm the lead learning disability nurse at HMP Park. Um, I'm Sophie. I'm one of the learning disability nurses at HMP Park. Um, and I'm Ariane Winsell. I'm one of the learning disability nurses at HMP Park. And as you can see on the screen, um, we've got a, a team of learning disability nurses all kind of working in different areas. Um, and obviously not all of them are able to be here today. Um, so today we're here to talk about our lived experience um, of changing the custody culture in part to support better healthcare outcomes and social care outcomes for people with learning disabilities and or autism. So we've done this through the Canos project and for those of you that don't speak Welsh, um, this translates into English as the inclusion project, which is everything really that our project stands for. So in, in order to understand how this project came around, it's first important to understand the structure of the prison. So the prison is essentially three prisons in one. So we have a VPU section. So this houses vulnerable adults and typically residents who live within this side of the prison have committed an offence of a sexual nature. Um, and then if we look at the mains, we've got um, it's effectively two prisons in one. So we've got a children's unit um, aged 15 to 18, and they have their own healthcare services. Um, but a pathway has been developed for transitioning from child to adult services. And then finally, we have the main prison, which consists of six house blocks, um, and this includes the high risk areas. So um, prior to the Canice project, they would have consisted of um, the Safer Custody Unit, the Phoenix Unit and Credoch. And special consideration was also given to A1 Unit, which at the time was housing residents with a learning disability difficulties or autism, but it didn't fall into the category of the high risk areas. So it's important to know this to understand the rationale of our scope and exercise for developing the Canos unit. So it was first, if we firstly look at the safer custody unit, this is the unit whereby residents will be housed with their experience in a relapse in their mental health. And then the Phoenix unit is a rehabilitation, rehabilitative unit by which the most high risk constructive prisoners in our care are housed for periods of assessment to reintegrate them back into the prison population. And then the credit unit then was a basic regime wing and acted really as a step down unit from the Phoenix. And then A1 unit at the time had achieved an autism accreditation award for the support of individuals with autism and or learning disability. Um, but there were recommendations from the National Autistic Society about the how, how the service could improve to better need, meet the needs of these individuals, which we'll discuss later on in the presentation. So there was a number of factors that contributed to the development of the Canish unit and project, including the Talbot Report 2008, which played a key role in our scope and exercise for the viability and need for the unit. Um, so the report outlined what somebody's life would look like in a custody setting if they had a learning disability and or autism. And although it was completed in 2008, this remains the most up-to-date study of lived experience of people with a learning disability in the custodial setting. So the outcome in summary um, was very bleak and some of the key findings are on the screen now for you to read through. Um, and then from the No One Knows report and the LEDR report, HMIP's joint inspection of the treatment of offenders with the learning disabilities within the criminal justice system. So phase one from arrest to sentence and then phase two and their time in custody in the community, we can safely say that this is a demographic of patients who experience significant health inequalities and will require support from admission right, right through to discharge, ensuring that there is transparent care and service involvement for continuity of care in the community, and then to try and re reduce the risk of reoffending. So people with learning disabilities have further identified barriers in a prison setting in comparison to the community which are displayed on the screen for you for there. In order for us to overcome all of these barriers, it was identified um, that the Kenosh unit would require specifically trained staff and peer mentors to meet the complex needs on the unit and an increased staffing um, to prisoner ratio. The unit would require specialist report and support from the learning disability nurses to minimise health inequalities, support with behaviour management strategies and ensure staff are receiving training to achieve this. It needed to be a standalone unit to safeguard these vulnerable groups um, and where they could continue to be active members in the community and progress off the unit. We wanted to improve patients' voice and choice in their lives in custody, and a scope and exercise was held to identify appropriate patients for the unit. In order for us to do this, we had to identify a diagnostic criterion from a, ma a medical perspective um, for the unit and a referral process which anyone can refer to. So that could be families, outside agencies, staff, peers, and most importantly, the individuals themselves. The diagnostic criterion includes someone with a learning disability, an intellectual disability, autism, Asperger's, 
ASC, um, a vulnerable adult in accordance with safeguarding procedures and a significant brain injury, which then affects their activities of daily living. It was important that we actually specified that it was a significant brain injury that affected their ADLs because in this environment the rate of head injuries and brain injuries in the population is quite high due to their chaotic lifestyles in the community. The same principle applies for defining ASC over neurodiversity conditions as neurodiverse conditions would actually include a diagnosis for ADHD. If we were specifically to look at the statistics for ADHD in a custody setting, it was estimated in the annual ADHD conference by Takeda that one in three people in a prison setting would have ADHD. So in Park, that would mean approximately 500 people, and we simply couldn't house 500 men in one unit. We then identified the diagnostic criteria for the unit. We completed a scope and exercise to identify patients that would meet the criteria. And we held forums um, which they could advocate their needs to shape the services on the Kunosh unit. We mentioned a referral process to the LD services and one of the ways in which we're able to quickly identify potential candidates who meet the service is through a do it profile. A do it profile is completed by every prisoner on admission. It's a web based screening tool that flags up deficits across four areas. If they score low on the do it profile, they'll automatically be referred to the learning disability services, which then automatically generates a learning disability nurse review. As part of the referral process, the referral is then discussed through an MDT. And when setting up the project, we set out indicators of success that we knew that our patients were typically housed in the high risk areas. And this is why our convenient sample is um, to measure the success has come from these four units. It's captured the majority of the demographic of our patients, but we acknowledge not all. Um, so from the move to the Kenosh unit, we can see that there's been a decrease in um, reportable incidents, self-harm, violence incidents, use of force incident, incidents and adjudications. We've actually seen an increase in our complaints, which we find is a very good aspect because we're actually advocating our patients' needs correctly. In regards to safeguarding, we found that these vulnerable patients were being used as guinea pigs for psychoactive drugs, and at this time it was quite a new drug, um, and their peers would exploit them to test out the strength of spice, and we were having regular emergencies where they could be unconscious and actually at risk of death. Since the move to the Kenosh unit, as a standalone, we've seen an overall decrease of 56% of patient emergencies being called for substance misuse. There's been an increase of 300% in appointments for our patients due to the increase in learning disability staff profile. And this is relevant because our patients have four times more access to learning disability nurses. Uh, so this brings me on to positive changes that we've made in HMP Park. Um, so we've secured protected case of time, which allows us to deliver person-centered care. And we have built good links with outside services, such as Western Bay Autism Service and the Sexual Assault Referral Team. And we currently do work with them to educate them on the needs of people with learning disabilities in our services. And we also work very closely with People's First Advocacy Service. Um, so we've developed the transgender pathway also for people with learning disabilities in a custody setting. Um, and another positive change was surrounding the IEP system. So the IEP system is a punitive framework set out to penalise people who do not conform to rules. Um, and we've identified that our patients may struggle to achieve the expected behaviour by the prison without reasonable adjustments. And um, so therefore, a pilot has currently been um, implemented in HMV Park, where judges have been specifically trained from the annals of nurses to support our patients through the IEP system. Um, someone who did struggle with the IP system was one of our success stories. So if you were to look at the yellow speech bubble, I'm allowed to read that yourself. Um, this um, particular patient um, came into the custody service at the age of 13. Um, he was misdiagnosed with ADHD at the age of 15, and he would engage in significant self-interest behaviours form of communication. Um, he would do short sentences and be released um, for periods no longer than two weeks. Um, and during the most recent sentence, um, through working with this patient, we identified he had autism. So we spent months of working with him um, and other services to get a diagnosis of autism and then build a therapeutic relationship with other professionals. Um, we then had to do a lot of work with the operational officers um, and train them to implement behaviour management plans. Um, and this required a lot of cultural changes, as mentioned previously in previous slides, um, where we discussed the IEP system. So we worked hard to see them with MAPA to secure funding from the appropriate placement, and he is now in a 24 hour supported living home. And um, this coming August, he will have been out of custody um, for two years, which is the longest time he would have ever spent outside of Pistols or Setting from the age of 13. 
Um, so as discussed in our success story, we have improved working nights with outside services, and this has not always been achievable due to security risks. Um, but we have also received a point of excellence um, or a good point of practice um, for the work we completed by HMIP in 2019. Um, and this is the first um, for Chris Oval Second in the UK. Um, we were awarded the RCN I the Intimacy Nursing Team of the Year Award in 2020 for the work we've completed as part of the Cummings project. Um, but despite all of this, we recognise that the service is far from perfect. And there's still so much more that we want to achieve and change, and not just in part, but across the UK custodial services. And um, so, for example, we do remain to come up against barriers of working with community teams, and which brings us on to the final point regarding the future workforce. And um, so within HMIP Inspector, there is no one from an integrity background who completes audits. And we have recently completed a piece of research with HMIP regarding new diverse services, in which this was flagged up. And um, this report is not yet published, but I'm hopeful this will start to change within the structure of HMIP inspections. And particularly because if the auditing and governing body probation and prisons do not um, place accountability on prisons to reduce health inequalities of people in disabilities, and then nothing's going to change. And um, so we also recognise that in Parker, with future workforce is not just our staff, but also our patients. And they will be released at some point, and we will require skills and pathways from, for them to be able to achieve employment. And we've been currently working really closely um, with Careers Wales regarding that, which has been quite successful, actually. Um, if we can support to achieve employment, this will reduce the risk of reoffending. Um, and specifically to a prison setting, there are no secondary learning disability teams in a prison setting, such as psychiatry, psychology, EOT, SALT, um, to meet the complex needs of our patients. Um, but we do have secondary services in a prison for mental health services. So in summary, hopefully we've shared the lived experience of professionals and people with um, learning disabilities and autism through our talk today. Uh, we've discussed diagnosis and a clear rationale as to why we use the terminology that we do. Um, we believe it is vital to, the train, to train the future workforce, especially within the demographic of patients. Um, and that the patients are also included as part of our um, future workforce. And um, regarding shaping services, we identified that there remain to be significant deficits in provisions for people with disabilities in custodial settings. And in closing, within a prison setting, we strive to mirror community services for our patients. And this is something we continue to be passionate about and striving for better future outcomes. And um, as a team on behalf of our patients, we continue to work and push HMIP to hold prison services comfortable in the UK to provide better provisions for our patients. Uh, thank you for listening. Is there any questions? Thank you very much. Gosh, that was a, a very impressive whistle stop uh, <laughs> tour of some very complex uh, work, which is uh, really very transformational. So thank you very much to the team uh, for presenting this and, and congratulations on your awards and recognition. Um, I've got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, and we have got a couple of minutes. Um, can I just check that you're able to stay with us for a few minutes before yeah. you get stuck out? Yeah, that's yeah. fine, yeah. That's lovely. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look. Uh, Marina Russ has asked, uh, she said she's very interested in your referral criteria for LD nurse input uh, to the unit. It seems quite broad, but uh, do you then encounter issues with referrals for people on release? She's saying when she worked in community services, they would get referrals for people being released from prison that didn't meet their criteria, such as they had an IQ assessed over 70, but there are no services to meet their needs. So our, def our working definition of a learning disability is um, obviously is based on DCM5. So sometimes we do come up against barriers for communities, but it doesn't tend to be around our diagnostic criteria. And we tend to be more around, they don't have specialists within their teams around offending behaviours. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, Paul has asked, uh, it's a comment really, but it, it leads into a question. Uh, most people with uh, autism do not like being touched in any way or told what to do. So how is this behaviour dealt with? Um, so this was one of the, yeah. the big um, hurdles we had to come over because obviously force is used within a prison service. Um, so it was more about changing the culture of the officers and, and increasing their education around the understanding of autism, um, particularly when, I suppose, black and white statements are made by some of our patients, which could be perceived as being offensive or threatening. So mm. it was about having a specialist group of, of officers that we trained to better meet and understand those needs to reduce that force being used. Yeah, OK, thank you. I mean, there's a lot of comments coming in. Uh, Peter has said most he agrees most autistic people don't like physical contact. 
Um, there's a comment here, Christine has asked, do you offer community support when people leave prison and what happens to ensure that there's no reoffending? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that's kind of um, the difficult thing because we we will do um, transitioning work if they're being released into the community and refer to the local community teams depending on where they're being released to. Um, but then really, when once they've left us, there's nothing, we don't really do anything then. Um, so you normally find that they end up reoffending and we get the same people coming in and out unless we can. Um, one of the difficulties is getting people diagnosed um, whilst they're in custody because the services are quite limited. So if we refer out for autism assessments, that could be a couple of years. If they're only a year to do a year, they end up going out and being released and then they refend, their behaviour refends. Whereas if we get the, manage to get the diagnosis, we can put some extra support measures in place when they're out to hopefully stop the reoffending. Um, sorry, yeah. just so we do support community teams, for instance, if somebody's going to like a 24 hour support service, mm -hmm. yeah. um, we do transitioning. So normally about six months before release, we would start arranging meetings where they get to meet the carers that they'll be working with in the future. Well, that's great. Thank you. There's a lot of questions in chat. So I, I think it would be really helpful. Maybe if you wouldn't mind dropping a, a contact into the chat that a couple of people maybe may want to contact you afterwards yeah. um, to carry on the conversation.